Welcome back to Crime Pod. Lynn Schultz grew up in Simsbury, Connecticut, and was an 18-year-old freshman at Middlebury College in Vermont when she disappeared on Friday, December the 10th, 1971. She was last seen at 2.15pm outside a gas station across the street from a large building which contained a health food store and an interstate bus station. At approximately 12.30 that afternoon, she was seen eating a bag of dried prunes. Why would anybody eat dried prunes? I'm sorry. Um, that she'd purchased from the store. All the good things. And expressed her dismay over having missed a bus that was travelling to New York City. It was an odd remark since it was the first day of final exams for the semester. Fifteen minutes later, Lynn was seen by a friend and fellow college student back in her dorm room. The two girls had an English exam together at one o'clock, but Lynn refused to discuss the test and seemed distracted. The friend left, returned five minutes later and observed that Lynn was no longer in her dorm room. The friend assumed she was on her way to take the final exam in the class they both shared, but Lynn didn't show up. She's next seen by another college friend at 2.15 near the gas station. Lynn Schultz's disappearance is considered suspicious since she left behind her identification, checkbook and other personal belongings. Despite some false sightings and false confessions over the years, the Schultz case has received little attention until March the 23rd, 2015 when Middlebury Police held a press conference in which they discussed their interest in Robin Durst, who owned the health food store, All the Good Things, in 1971, near where Schultz was last seen. Durst had been arrested nine days earlier, March the 14th, in Los Angeles for the murder of Susan Berman. The first-degree murder charges in that case stemmed from the HBO documentary series The Jinx. Middlebury press conference did not reveal any information that linked Durst to the Schultz disappearance except to say they received an anonymous telephone tip in 2012 that Durst owned the health food store near where Schultz was last seen. This is a person who is very interesting to us, Middlebury Police Chief Tom Hanley said during the press conference. However, he stopped short of saying if Durst was a suspect or even a person of interest. In spite of this, media outlets around the world reported that there was a link between Durst and Schultz's disappearance. Lynn Schultz is 5 foot 3 inches tall at the time of her disappearance, weighed 115 pounds. She has light brown hair and blue eyes. She was wearing a navy blue pullover sweater, a brown nylon ski parka blue jeans and hiking boots when she disappeared. She may have been depressed at the time of her disappearance. If she were alive today, Lynn would be 62 years old. I found another thing um, that for her sisters and it says 48 years later, Lynn Schultz's sisters are still searching. The Schultz family puts together an annual calendar matching photos with the birth dates of the many members of the Connecticut-based clan. Individuals play a recurring, starring role on the day they came into the world. Lynn Schultz's face is featured twice in her family's calendar, once on February the 9th when she was born in 1953, and again on December 10, the date on which she disappeared from Middlebury in 1971. Lynn's sisters, Anne Schultz and Janet Schultz Swain, are still hoping to clear up the mystery surrounding their siblings' fate. They were in town last week for two days to walk through Middlebury, get an update from the detective who continues to investigate her case, and search through the Addison Independent Archives for any clues that might finally shed light on what happened to their sister on a day she was preparing to take a final exam and cap her first semester at the college almost 48 years ago. Anne Schultz has been to Middlebury seven times since 1971, searching for clues. Schultz and Swain think about their sister often. What would she look like today? What she would have done with her young promising life? I feel like Lynn is with me daily, Swain said. I think about her all the time. 
We all get together and I think, these are all the nieces and nephews she's never met. What job would she be retiring from at this point? The Independent first reported on Lynn Schultz's case in 2005. Hers is one of the oldest active missing person cases on file in Vermont. Her story was thrust into the national spotlight in March of 2015 when Middlebury Police confirmed one of the last places Lynn was seen prior to her December 10th 1971 disappearance was at a bus stop on Court Street eating dried prunes that she'd purchased from All Good Things, a health food store that Robert Durst had operated with his wife Kathleen from 1971 to 1972. Durst, a New York real estate scion, is slated to go on trial this coming January for the alleged 2000 murder of his longtime friend Susan Berman. Meanwhile, Schultz family members continue to seek answers as the 48th anniversary of Lynn's disappearance approaches. Our main purpose is to keep our sister's name and story alive, Anne Schultz said. A big piece of this is to encourage anyone who might have information, even a vague recollection, to share it with Middlebury Police. Noted local historian and retired Middlebury College professor Glenn Andre gave the sisters a guided tour through the country's Shire Town while providing them context on how the downtown had looked during the fall of 1971 when Lynn was on campus. Lynn, in her many letters to family and friends, occasionally alluded to her preferred Middlebury stores. Most of the stores Lynn frequented back then are alas no more, except for the Vermont bookshop where she acknowledged shopping. Another one of her favourites, Little Wings, was a knick-knack shop that had a very brief run during the early 70s. She was fascinated by the novelty of things hanging in the store, some leather things, woven items, Schultz said. It's clear Lynn felt a connection to Addison County, according to her sisters. She took a whittling class at the Vermont Craft Centre at Frog Hollow. She really enjoyed it. She did a project and showed her whittling project to several of her Middlebury College friends, Schultz said. She hiked local scenic sites as a member of the Middlebury College Outdoor Club. She also enjoyed cycling and downhill skiing. Two of Lynn's Simsbury, Connecticut friends also attended Middlebury during the fall semester of 1971, which probably made her transition to college life smoother. Also worth noting is that Lynn did a fair amount of travelling outside of Middlebury during weekends in order to be with the high school friends who, like her, had matriculated to various New England colleges. Since Lynn didn't keep a car on campus, she would catch rides with friends or take the bus, Schultz explained. Her weekend travel, strong circle of friends and diligent study habits seemed to conflict with a narrative advanced by past investigators that Lynn was depressed and voluntarily left the Middlebury campus. Swain noted former Middlebury police chief Robert Van Ness from the beginning said he didn't believe Lynn had become the victim of foul play. He said, I think this was a young lady who needed some time by herself and she'll get back in touch with people when she's good and ready. Yeah. Schultz noted Lynn had spoken to her folks on December the 8th, 1971, two nights prior to her disappearance. Their mum, who passed away in 94, wrote a summary of the content of their conversation, which is now part of the Lynn Schultz file at the Middlebury Police Department. She wrote that Lynn was in good spirits and looking forward to coming home, Schultz said. Also on December the 8th, Lynn is said to have told a friend she was caught up with her studying and was ready to take her exams. She did not run away, said Swain, who instead believes her sister lost her life. We'd like to find out what happened to her, where her remains are, if possible, and why it happened. From the beginning we felt like she'd been killed. But despite that, we all kept hoping, maybe, the unthinkable was that she'd done the unthinkable and disappeared. But I think we all knew. The worst case scenario seemed almost inevitable when those first holidays rolled round and Lynn hadn't surfaced. We all really felt that when she didn't come home for Christmas, Schultz said, that was two weeks later. It was totally out of character for her. There was seriously something wrong. 
She doesn't believe Lynn would have secretly changed addresses. She had a very close group of friends, Schultz said. She would have communicated with one of them. Had she decided to do the mythical thing of hopping on a bus and going to California or wherever it could have been. We'd like the real truth of what happened to her. Lynn Schultz was reported to have last been seen at 2.15pm on December the 10th, 1971, standing on Court Street across from the bus stop and All Good Things store. One of the last people to see her did not know Lynn, had a brief conversation with her and did not pick up on the feeling that she was upset. She used several other descriptions that got carried into news articles that she was depressed, Schultz said. That is not a description I would ever use for my sister. Instead, her sisters described Lynn as full of life and curiosity and very eager to explore and experience things. She loved meeting new people and wanted the challenge of new adventures, Schultz said. The Schultz family had shared with investigators all of its correspondence to and from Lynn in hopes a paragraph, sentence or word might provide a key to unlocking the mystery of her disappearance. Any of Lynn's friends who might still have letters from the missing Middlebury student should provide copies to Middlebury Police. Detective Chris Bowdish is the latest Middlebury Police officer to inherit Lynn's case. I'm interested in talking to anyone who was living in Middlebury in 1971, even if they didn't know or see Lynn, Bowdish told The Independent in an email. As I see it, this case is still wide open and I will work with any lead that comes in. Bodish can be reached on 802 388 3191, 3191 or at kbodish at middlebrypolice.org. We're very appreciative of Detective Chris Bodish, Swain said. She is persistent and she cares. She's doing this on her own time, we've learned because she has to focus on her current cases. I appreciate her professionalism. I have a lot of trust in her integrity. Though the years roll by since Lynn's disappearance, the Schultz family hasn't given up hope of finding answers, so that Lynn's face only appears once on the family calendar, on her birthday. We're hopeful that after all this time, that something may still happen, Swain said.